from Americans for Prosperity Foundation in Arkansas, Mr. David Ray. Where is Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is David Ray. I'm the State Director for Americans for Prosperity Arkansas. And uh, we're proud to help bring uh, the next part of the presentation today to all of you. Um, for the next 40 minutes, um, we will have a federal affairs sort of policy discussion with our state's senior U.S. Senator, Senator John Bozeman. Um, Americans for Prosperity, as many of you know, exist to recruit, educate, and mobilize citizens in support of the policies and goals of a free society at the local, state, and federal levels of government with the ultimate goal of helping each and every American pursue their own version of the American dream and improve their own lives, especially the least fortunate. Um, one thing that I do want to mention uh, before we get started with the program is um, Americans for Prosperity Foundation has a table there in the back. And if you haven't filled out a ticket yet to enter in our drawing, at the end of today, we're going to have a drawing for a $100 Visa gift card. So somebody's got to win. It might as well be you. Sometime before the end of the day, fill out your ticket and drop it in that bucket. The next thing that I want to mention is on each of your tables, there should be a handful of index cards. Um, David Ellswick, uh, who's a radio host, many of you know, is going to be helping moderate this uh, discussion today. He's going to be asking questions to Senator Bozeman. At the end, we'll have uh, a few minutes for some, uh, some questions that are submitted by the attendees. If you guys want to submit a question, uh, write it down on the index cards that are at your table. And then Zach Cuban, Zach, if you'll raise your hand and wave to everybody, Zach is going to be walking around. Um, uh, hopefully un unintrusively throughout the presentation collecting people's cards and, and we'll take a few of those at the end. Um, moderating today's discussion, as I, as I mentioned, is going to be Dave Ellswick. As many of you know, Dave Ellswick has been named one of the top 100 most influential talk show hosts by Talkers Magazine for the last 11 years. I'm not even, I'm not even been working for 11 years, so that's quite an achievement. Um, Dave is a friend of Americans for Prosperity and he's a friend of economic freedom and individual liberty here in the natural state and um, so I'm pleased that he's going to be joining us. If, you're, if you don't already listen, Dave's show is on 96.5 FM, The Voice of the Answer, uh, here in Little Rock, uh, Monday through Friday, 2 to 6 p.m. You should tune in. And our guest this afternoon is Arkansas's senior U.S. Senator John Bozeman. Senator Bozeman is a businessman, a lifelong resident of Arkansas. Uh, he was elected to the United States Senate in 2010, replacing former U.S. Senator Blanche Lincoln. And he has been... And before that, served in the United States House of Representatives representing Arkansas's third congressional district. Uh, I do want to mention, Senator Bozeman has a uh, lifetime voting record with Americans for Prosperity of 88%, and in the current Congress, uh, 2015 and 2016, is a 100% score on the issues that we have graded in the Congress. So I do want to stipulate, uh, today's forum is a policy forum, it's not a campaign event, we don't endorse candidates, but we are very excited to have Senator Bozeman here uh, to hear his thoughts on all of these issues ranging from taxes and spending to debt and energy and health care and, and so many economic issues that impact our everyday lives. If you would please welcome our moderator, Mr. Dave Ellswick, and our United States Senior Senator, John Bergman.
Everybody hear me? There we are. Okay. All right, we've got a series of questions for the Senator that I'd like to talk to him about. And as you heard David Ray, he said that uh, if you have a question, if you write it down on the cards that are on your table, pass it over to the gentleman that's over here on your left, or on my left, if he'll raise his hand for you. He'll go through the, the questions. Remember, this is policy, it's not election, so I know there's a lot of, you know, Cruz supporters, Trump supporters, and all kinds of supporters, and a lot of anti, what I mean from this is saying anti-Hillary people. Oh, no. Uh, anyway, anti-Hillary people here, so uh, bottom line, we're not going to get into that. We'll do that on my show on Monday, okay? That'll work. Senator, how are you today? I'm doing great. I feel like David Frost, except that you're not Richard Nixon. <laughs> That's not all. They brought these big chairs up here. Another you want to know the bad thing about all this? They call us the elder statesmen now. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Let's start off with the economy. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reports that the pace of the current Obama recovery has been by far the weakest of any since 1949. What policies do you believe most contributed to this weak recovery? What policies do you think are most needed? The jump start of the economy. Well, as you say, Dave, this is the, the least recovery uh, since 1949. This is also, President, when you look at the growth in the GDP that the country's had during his his term in office, he's going to go out with the least ever of any president, the least ever of any president. And so, as to what's doing that, you all know. You all are business people. You're out in the out in the real world, and, and the reality is, right now. Uh, you simply don't know what's going to happen. We know that health care costs are going to rise in the future. All of the uncertainty that's out there, we know that regulatory things have, have increased dramatically in regard to regulation and its effect on the economy. Um, this president is going to have to release, I think he's released his 600 major, major thing that is over $100 million. So the regulatory atmosphere, uh, the jump in health care costs have gone up dramatically. We're in a situation now where the last thing that anybody's going to do uh, that runs a company is run out and hire a bunch of people. So we've got to get ourselves in a situation where, where we've got to have confidence. We're a 70% consumption economy. We depend on you and I buying things to make this thing work. Now we need to reverse that. We need to make it such that we start manufacturing things again and get this thing more in balance. But right now, we're a 70% consumption economy. Uh, if we're not, you know, if we don't feel like the country's moving in the right direction, we're not going to buy things. We're not going to hire people. And it's a downward spiral. This is the first time ever that, that when you poll people, and I'm an example of the American dream. My dad was a master sergeant in the Air Force, worked hard, got my brother and sister and I a good education. Uh, we started a little eye clinic, my brother and I, that became a big eye clinic. And, uh, you know, worked hard, played by the rules, and were able to get ahead. This is the first time ever that we told Americans today that they say that they don't feel like the American dream is going to be there for their, for their loved ones, for their families. So those, those are the things we've got to, got to work on. All right, let's talk a little bit about liberty. It's something that I talk a lot about on my show. You've been on my show many, many times. We've talked about this. And there's an overwhelming sense that the uh, last eight years under this president and his public policy have led to a massive erosion of our liberty. We see that in policies like Obamacare, where every American is now mandated to enter into a financial transaction to buy health insurance under penalty of law. So how can we begin now to restore the liberty that we've lost, or is that even possible? Well, I think it is possible in the sense that a lot of what Obama has done has been through executive action. The power of the presidency is great. Sadly, Congress has let it grow more than it should. We need to tamp that back. We need to get after the regulatory agencies. But so much of this is through executive action. So much of it is through the agencies, you know, creating uh, you know, situations where, where they mandate things. So the new president, whoever that is, if they like, 
can get rid of that the stroke of the pen. The other thing that's come about is, is that the, the courts, as they deal with this, are looking you know, very, very carefully. And a bunch of Obama stuff has been overturned. In fact, it's interesting, Dave, the legacy of this president might be that he doesn't have any legacy because it is so easy to undo these things. Uh, the problem with the court system is it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, uh, but, but we've had good luck you know, with a lot of the regulatory stuff and being overturned, like his unlawful uh, illegal immigration, you know, trying to grant amnesty and all that. Courts tied that up. That's a good thing. Let's talk about health care. As far as the loss of liberty, that's one of the, the biggest attacks that this administration and the Democrats have, have done. Uh, in, in their time in the last eight years. And it continues to be a disaster. I was talking about a story just uh, earlier this week about Aetna has now announced that they will not continue with Obamacare into uh, 2017. We've heard other insurance companies bailing out of, uh, of Obamacare. We've got everything from skyrocketing premiums to the erosion of the 40-hour work week that's taken their toll on millions of Americans. Uh, do you support a full repeal of Obamacare? And until the political climate shifts to the point where the whole law can be repealed, what are some stopgap measures that Congress should be pursuing in order to provide relief to the American people from this disastrous piece of legislation? I do support and have voted many times for a full repeal of Obamacare. And in fact, we were able to, with 51 votes, send the bill to the president's vote that would have gutted Obamacare. The problem was he vetoed it, which we expected you to do, and then you, you know, then the, you have the two-thirds uh, threshold to, call, to 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 achieve, which is very, very difficult. It just shows how important the next president is going to be, in the sense we've got to have somebody that, as you pass things through Congress, the other thing that, that we passed through was uh, gutting Planned Parenthood. Obamacare is a complete failure, yeah. and I and I think we're seeing that. You know, we've talked about that for a long, long time. And this is something that that I've been very, very interested in. I understand. I'm an optometrist, and I doctor by training. And so, uh, what what happened was we were in a situation where uh, healthcare was getting unaffordable. The idea was to, to do something about that, or that's how this was solved. And you remember, it was, you know, everybody was going to save $2,500 or maybe you can keep the family doctor and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's turned into just the opposite of that. You know, the reverse has been true. Most Arkansans right now are in a situation where they have five, $10,000 deductibles. You know, for a hardworking Arkansan, that's not health insurance, that's catastrophic health insurance. They simply don't have the, the money to do that. So the other problem with it is the only way that you can that you can make it such that you can make it more affordable is to ration it, to ration. It. And uh, what we're seeing now is uh, doing that by cutting physician payments, things like that. Many many of you are Medicare age. It's becoming more and more difficult to find a physician, a provider that will accept Medicare because over $700 billion was taken out of the Medicare system to help pay for Obamacare. And they've done that by cutting, uh, again, you know, cutting physician payments. The other problem is, is that when you look at the systems that, that this was governed, really set up on the UK system, the Canadian system, they don't have a lot of hospitals. Uh, you, you control cost, again, by consolidation and rationing. But in consolidation, we're starting to lose a lot of our community hospitals, or our community hospitals are getting themselves in trouble. The problem with that is, you know, Arkansas, much of America is, is rural. And so if you lose your community hospital, those are the best paying jobs in town. It's the first thing that, that business looks at when they're going to come to town. It's the first thing that retirees look at stuff. So pretty soon you lose your community. So it really is serious. Uh, you know, you mentioned the insurance companies, but they simply can't make this thing work. So it's got to be reformed. So, well, John, what do you do about that? <clears throat> what you do is you get the free market back into it. You allow, you allow uh, people to buy across straight lines. You know, my, my car insurance.
insurance from the State Farm. I don't know where the State Farm is headquartered, but it's not in Arkansas. I look at the Geico commercials, and if I think that's a better deal, then you know, I, can, I can shop and buy that any place. We need to be able to shop across state lines. We need more competition. We also need to allow small businesses to pool my barber, you know, to pool with thousands of other barbers, get a better deal. Uh, health savings accounts are so important, yes. making such that that's tax free. Uh, and the list goes on and on. And then finally, with that list though, it's very important, is making such that we have, get rid of the nuisance losses that are driving up costs, and they truly are driving yes. up costs. We've got a lot of counties in Arkansas where physicians aren't delivering babies because of the fact that the high health insurance premium. So, uh, you know, those are things that we simply have. Senator, let me ask a question about, we were talking about some of the uh, insurance companies pulling out. One of the reasons for that, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but Senator Rubio and Senator Cruz identified the risk quarter uh, in the legislation for Obamacare and got that repealed and got it out. The risk quarter allowed insurance companies that they were losing money in Obamacare to be um, get that money back through tax money. They can't do that any longer, and so now it's not a problem. You know, that's a win-win situation. Then, for if they lose, they win. If they win, they win. Uh, because of that, a lot of them now are, are getting out. Your thoughts on that? Well, it, again, it's it's falling apart uh, in the sense that, that that's not going to be there. It's not working even with that there. That's not going to be there, and that's just going to exacerbate the problem. The other thing, though, that you mentioned, and this is so important, you know, we're, we're becoming a nation of part-time workers because people are, Americans are smart. You know, I look out and I see all of y'all, they're such good business people. And, and you figure out, you look at the rules, you can play with good rules, you can play with bad rules, you need to know the rules, and so, and so much of our problem with the economy is just not knowing the rules as far as regulation. But we know what the healthcare rules are going to be. So employers are starting to work around it. So they work around it with part-time people. I was visiting with an individual, and, and it'd be interesting, I'll be around after this is over, grab me, tell me your stories, but uh, this individual was in a situation where he had 52 employees. So all this stuff was gonna come in and hit him. Uh, going over the 50 employee threshold, it was gonna cost him $150,000 when he was in business. Well, he wasn't making you know, a whole lot more than that. So pretty soon he was only going to have 49 employees. And that's the sad thing about this. Uh, another gentleman, uh, an accountant, Fort Smith, and he had a business where he relied uh, on individuals, a lot of them retired military, a lot of them senior citizens that, that were on uh, uh, Medicare, so they had their own health insurance. And so the health insurance that he was offering, they weren't picking up. He couldn't get enough people to participate in his program. And he was talking about that costing well over $100,000. This business is not making a whole lot of money, but he does it because he loves his employees. You know, they're like family. They're providing a service. He, you know, he's able to give them a job. His, his primary thing is his, his, his other business. So he can do that. But if this continues to go, he's going to have to give that business up in the sense, you know, you, you just can't do it when you lose your money. But these are the, 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 the opposite, uh, you know, influences that we need to have in the situation as we go forward. So it's got to be fixed, it's a mess, and, and again, that's why I'm for getting rid of it and starting over, and, and we can do a better job and solve these problems at a much lower cost and there are significant problems that need to be solved. All right, we've talked about Obamacare enough. Let's move on to one of my favorite uh, government agencies. I don't have very many. In fact, yeah. this one's not one of my favorite, the EPA. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the IRS either. Don't like the Department of Education either. But uh, when it comes down to this, it goes on. It goes on and on, yeah. EPA, uh, under President Obama, uh, we've seen a disturbing trend to bypass Congress and to do through executive order what the President cannot pass legislatively. One of the most high-profile examples of the EPA's so-called Clean Power Plan, or better known as the War on Coal, uh, explain to us 
exactly what that is and what is your position on President Obama's so-called clean power plan? Well, of course I'm very much against it and the reason being is, is that I talked earlier about the fact that we've got to get our manufacturing base up. Uh, you know, we're trying to compete with the rest of the world. What does it do if you artificially raise your energy rates up? Uh, that's that's really the, the, the backbone that you've got to have is cheap energy that you produce with other countries. Uh, these plants, uh, these facilities use lots of electricity. The other thing is, what does it do as you artificially raise uh, with this, this scheme? Uh, what does it do to single moms? What does it do to people on fixed incomes? And the list goes on and on. So, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a crazy plan. It's something that uh, again, you know, I, I'm certainly voted against it. And uh, the good news is the courts have got it on hold. But but we talk a lot about helping the middle class and the lower middle class, which we desperately need to do. Wages will be flat forever. But what does that do? You're working on plants. You're working your heart out. Uh, you know, you, you get a get a little raise. Your health insurance premium wipes that out. And then all of a sudden, the utility bill goes up 50% in the plant. You've got absolutely nothing to show for it. It's not like you've got a new piece of equipment you know, or something like that. And so again, that money's got to come from someplace. And you might be able to raise things up a little bit, but you simply can't recover the whole thing. So as a result, you know, you just don't, you know, wages continue to be flat, things like that. So these are the kind of things, as we talked about earlier, these are the kind of things that are, that are killing our economy. Another uh, piece of legislation, or push by President Obama, it's not even really legislation, uh, is the Waters of the U.S. Rule. Uh, I'd like you to talk about that and what it represents and, and how big of an enormous overreach of federal power that it is. It is a tremendous overreach of federal power. It's clearly unconstitutional. I've had the opportunity to serve on the uh, Transportation Committee of the House, and now I'm on the, the Infrastructure Committee, the Public Works Committee in the Senate. When I was in the House, I was always on the Waters Subcommittee, and, and actually was the ranking member, the head Republican, uh, when I left the House and came over on Waters, and then became, uh, for a time, the head Republican on Public Works on the waters. Uh, and so I, I really do understand it very, very well. The Supreme Court has ruled in the past. The Constitution clearly says navigable waters. The Supreme Court has, has kind of made it such that navigable waters and maybe not the right adjacent, you know, that we'll consider that. Uh, but this, what they want to do is, is literally, if there's a drainage ditch out in front of your house, if you're going to add on to your house, add on to your business or whatever, then you're going to have to get a permit coming out of Washington to do that. So it's all about land use. It's all about land control. Agriculture has been excluded uh, in the different in the different rules that have come about as we as people pass legislation in Congress. This is all about getting agriculture under control, development under, uh, under control, and really just just public planning coming out of Washington, D.C. So it's a tremendous overreach. The good news is the courts have said, yeah, you know, you're right, it is overreach. In fact, this is one of those things that if Justice Scalia hadn't died, this would have been put to, to rest, you know, with, a, with a, a vote that would have carried it, and we wouldn't have to be worrying about this right now. Uh, so with a deadlock, you know, it's still in a situation where you can't go forward but the next president is going to do one judge for sure, because in the Senate, we're not going to let this judge go forward. And some people come to me and say, John, you know, you ought to do that. This guy's a moderate. He's not a moderate. He's, in 19 out of 20 instances, he's always voted with the agency. He's not crazy. He's very, very smart. But he's not a moderate. He would be a consistent vote and always vote with the others. Okay? So he's not going forward. But it does show how important the next president being able to select at least one judge, probably two, because Justice Jim Ginsburg is, is elderly, having some health problems, and, and fair chance of three. So um, it just shows how important that's going to be in the future. But uh, the good news is the waters of the U.S. is on hold, but uh, it, it is a great example of the 
tremendous special offer. Now, the judge you're talking about is Garland, is that correct? Yes. Okay. The United States federal debt when President Obama took office was $10.6 trillion. We thought it was high then. By the end of his presidency, it's expected to surpass $20 trillion. Help us explain why the national debt is such a huge problem and how we can begin to tackle a problem that's this big. Well, as I go around the state and, and visit with you all, the, the two major things that I hear about are jobs, 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 and the economy. If you don't have a job, if you can't take care of your family, then a lot of these other things are pretty unimportant. The other thing that's right there with that, though, is national security. And, and the debt is so important to both of those. Uh, right now, we, we have a tremendous debt, but we have the lowest interest rate that we're paying on the debt ever. The problem is, for every 1% increase, it's like 1.7 plus, 1.7 at least, trillion dollars in servicing that debt. Right now, we're paying almost, we're paying a lot of interest. We're getting very, very low interest rate. Historically, the interest rate has been five, six percent. And things cycle down, they cycle back up. You know, it is gonna cycle back up. So you can imagine 1.7 over over 10 years is an astronomical amount of money. This thing gets where we increase in a couple percent, two or three percent, whatever. You get in a situation where literally all of the, the funds that you have are, are eaten up by service and debt. So we have to get a, a hand on Admiral Mullen uh, testified a few years ago and they asked him, you know, what was the greatest threat uh, that we faced? He said the debt and the deficit. So, you know, you all cut back, hardworking on Kansans cut back in, in times when you don't have the money. The federal government has to do the same thing. Uh, it's got to be efficient, it's got to be effective, and it's got to be accountable. And uh, so again, it's a great threat that we face. And, and, and don't kid yourself, you know, the president has, has created this debt and every instance is advocated for increased uh, spending, increased uh, programs, you know, this and that, and, and would have greatly added to this, uh, you know, if, if he would have been able to buy. Probably the greatest example of that, uh, Dave, is, the, uh, is Bernie Sanders with his plans. Of, I can't remember how many trillions of dollars he would have added you know, over a period of 10 years, but it's, it's astronomical. It's everything for everybody. Free talent for everybody. Free, free, free everything. As we all know, there is no such thing as anything being free. Somebody pays for it. Well, Marco Rubio made the, the comment that uh, uh, that he would make a great president, Bernie Sanders of Sweden. Yeah, and that's, that's true. <laughs> Let's talk about regulatory overreach because that is a very very important uh, topic uh, for our country. Dodd-Frank was passed. Uh, it was supposed to fix what was ailing the financial system in the wake of the 2008-2009 uh, market crash. But like so many Washington-based solutions, it's only made things worse. Ask people who are trying to buy a house today. If you could, can you explain for the average uh, person that's sitting here today why Dodd-Frank is such a bad policy, and what can be done about it? Well, again, this is like Obamacare. This is something that needs to be repealed. This was one of the things that was passed. Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, they, they tried to pass cap and trade during that period when the Democrats, Democrats had control of, of both houses and had control of the presidency. They didn't get cap and trade passed, because people like you rose up and just said, enough is enough. You know, you're not going to quadruple, you know, our, our uh, electricity rates and our energy rates and all this. This is crazy. But Dodd-Frank was designed to, to make it such that, uh, you know, you were going to address the problems with the big banks. The problem is, is that the regulations that they put in are one size fits all. And so you've got all the community banks being subject to tremendous regulation. I was talking to a banker the other day, and, and literally, he said that the examiners came, this is just a, a single community bank, you know, in a little bitty town. They came in, and there was more bank examiners, like 12 or 13 bank examiners in there, 
There were no bank examiners or were the people that worked at the bank. They had to bring in cap card tables and all this kind of stuff. So this this regulatory is is greatly increasing the cost of our community banks. The one size fits all doesn't work. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take the risk out of capitalism. My brother and I, you know, started without anything. We got had a good education. I'm an eye doctor. He was an optometrist. He's an ophthalmologist and eye surgeon. And so we we got through school at the same time. Decided to set up practice together. So we got with the community bank. Told him you know our plan and stuff and and. Uh, and he knew that we had a good education. He liked us. So he called us later in the afternoon and said, John, we're going to approve your loan. But he said, isn't there anything we can do to get you a positive net worth you know, as we go forward? He said, again, we just didn't have anything. But they took a chance on us. And they made a lot of money on us in the sense that we paid a lot of interest to that bank through the years. We made a lot of money off of them, though, using that money in a wise way. And that's what it's all about. We can go around the room today and, and just talk to individuals that have been successful and say, you know, how did you, and that would be the story that we told. The problem is right now, if I went down with my brother in a similar, sense, a similar situation, I, we couldn't be able to check all those boxes and not qualify. So as a result, 75 jobs would have been created. You know, we wouldn't have provided the health care that we did in the community we were. And uh, it, it's just a job killer, and there's, it's just a, it's those kind of things. The community banks are not only the ones that are making loans in the community, and how much safer it is for a community bank that knows the family, uh, knows the individuals, you know, as they make those loans, as opposed to a Bank of America. I'm not knocking Bank of America, the bigger banks, but the, the community banks we have to. You know, we have to nurture. The other thing is, you look around the community, it's in their best interest to grow that community, so they're the ones with the, the signs on the school boards and, you know, the, the rooms in the hospital and all of those kind of things. So, uh, it, it is a, another example of a terrible bill that uh, needs to be done away with. How many people here own a business? A lot. Okay, so this next question uh, will affect you. One of the latest regulations that's just now getting some attention is the Department of Labor's overtime rule. Tell us what this rule is about and what does it mean for our economy, for our workers, and for our businesses. Well, this is a rule that the Department of Labor arbitrarily decided to, uh, to put out. And again, we're talking about a, unelected bureaucracy that's part of the administration that has the authority to do this. Now, one thing that we've got to do in Congress is, is take back some of that authority. There's a, a bill called the Reins Act that if a, uh, a bill has over $100 million worth of effect on the economy, then it would go back to Congress for congressional re review and approval. Uh, those are the kind of things that we need to do. But this particular act, what it does, it, it, it says who's an exempt employee and who's not. In other words, who is a, a person of authority that, that, you know, is there and working in things that if they're busy that day and they work a little longer, but because of their managerial function, you don't pay them overtime. They're a salary. And uh, the threshold has gone from, what, a little over 20000 to 37000 46,000, yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's gone up dramatically. The other problem is these thresholds, it's the same in San Francisco as it is here in Arkansas. So you've got the same threshold, which makes no sense at all, in the sense that you know, certainly the, the cost of doing business in San Francisco or Washington, D.C., or you, know, you name a place like that, as opposed to Dumas, Arkansas, or, you know, rural Arkansas, or even Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. But again, this was arbitrarily done. Now, the, the ones that this is really going to affect are uh, the nonprofits. And uh, they depend on, on people that work hard during certain times of the year. 
And then, you know, they're, they're flexible. They, they say, well, you know, you work so hard then, you know, you have more time, you know, here and there. But all of that flexibility is going to go away. Uh, the other thing that's going to, going to be affected a lot are our, uh, our colleges and universities. Uh, and that's going to be a situation where there's going to be an increase in tuition once this is all figured out, just because of that, and probably a very significant increase. So these things have tremendous impact. I'm elected. Uh, it's something that, uh, you know, again, we're going to have to make it such that we fight back over this particular rule, okay? but also we make it such that we take the authority where an unelected bureau bureaucracy, the Department of Labor, has the ability to throw these things out. They're too powerful. Let's talk about free speech. The IRS has for some time now been a rogue agency. What is the solution to bringing in this out of control government agency? They've attacked conservative groups. They've attacked conservative individuals. They've tried to tamp down free speech. How do we rein it in? Well, I think you know, ideally you rein it in by having a new president that's going to put somebody in charge that, that's going to clean house and, and do this. Um, until then, what we can do and what we've really actually done a pretty good job of is cutting the budget and uh, making it such that they just don't have the funds to deal with. And then, in the sense of giving them the funds that they, that they get, directing those towards customer service, which is simply atrocious. Uh, they had a deal, what was it? It was, it was like after you were on hold day for so many minutes, it was like after you were on hold for like an hour, they did like, they called it the courtesy disconnect. <laughs> that they, were, they were the hand on you, it seems to, you know, they felt like they were doing you a favor, you know, by, by doing, it's just absolutely crazy. We waste a billion dollars in the IRS by people in federal penitentiaries sitting around in their cells doing schemes to, to uh, collect refunds. And that could be done, that could be fixed in a second if the IRS would take the trouble to talk to the federal penitentiary system, which is also a federal entity, and talk, go back and forth. Again, that's something that could be fixed like that. But they simply don't do it. I mean, it's just, and the list goes on and on. So I think the biggest thing is is making sure that their their funding is at the bone, and and you do want them to have enough money that they can provide the customer service. So what money you give them, trying to direct, rather than servicing Obamacare and some of these other things, trying to direct it into customer service, uh, so that we can do a much much better job. Right? All right, Senator. You appear on my show regularly, so I'm going to stop asking the questions that I have written down, and we're going to start asking the questions that the audience would like to know. Uh, we've talked about the EPA, we've talked about the IRS, we've talked about the uh, Department of Energy, the Department of, of Labor. What is the Senate doing to curtail these uh, government bureaucracies, the unelected and unaccountable no, and, and again, that's an excellent question. You know, we, we described a lot of the problem of what's going on, and we have to, to do a couple of things. First of all, the laws as they've been written have been written too loosely. Mm -hmm. We have to write laws that specifically say this or that. Uh, what's, what's, you know, these are complicated issues, so there's a tendency to write these laws when they're, they're loosely written, and then the agency itself fills in the regulation. That's no good because the agencies that we have now, it, it would work if you had people in there that were trying to do what Congress wanted to do. Uh, the problem is we've got these rogue agencies. And so they write the regulation and then you think, you know, what does that have to do with what, what we intended? So, uh, we've got to write the, the regulations tighter. The other thing we have to do is institute, as I mentioned earlier, bills like the RAINS Act, where you, you make it such that if an agency comes out with a bill that affects the economy in a significant way, and $100 million is significant, uh, as I said earlier, I think Obama is on a 600 bill. He's going to be probably, by the time he gets done, 
and everybody on Friday just kind of sits around with their teeth gritted because that's when they dump them out because that's a low news but uh, he'll have increased it by 30 percent compared to anybody else so we have the rains act things like that that make it such that once they do these big 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 things that are going to affect the economy uh, that they come back to Congress so Congress can examine it approve it and, uh, and again it just gets in control can I, can I ask you to expound just a little bit that these bureaucratic organizations do the bidding of the president who's in office. Uh, how do you control them? I mean, this is just another example of executive overreach. Well, it's difficult. You know, we, we live in a, a, a free society and, you know, I, I try and do, you know, I've had so many people and, and individuals that come up and, and basically their advice is, John, just do what's right. Do your best, just do what's right. And right now we're in a situation, we've got a president, we've got these agencies where the end justifies the means. Uh, they do things that they don't have the power to do. And in the past, you know, they should have done it, you know, like this. Uh, so much of what we depend on in the free and open society that we have comes out of trying to do the right thing, regardless of who you are. Uh, you can't have a rule for everything. Uh, but these these folks, again, the end justifies the means and they're, they're pushing forward. So as a result, uh, Congress has to fight back. The court system is the ultimate is the ultimate stopper. And the good news is on much of the stuff that the president's tried to, to do, uh, the immigration stuff, you mentioned waters of the US in there, these major things the courts have said no, you simply can't do that. But it takes a lot of time, it costs a lot of money, and it shouldn't be that way. Now, this question goes along with what we were just talking about. Uh, this says, we were successful in gaining control of Congress. Most of those elected ran on the same goals and ideas of change and control. But there is a level of frustration today because it seems we lose momentum once they get to Washington. How do we get elected officials to perform? Well, I think, as I mentioned earlier, you know, in regard to Obamacare, if we had a president that signed the bill, we would have got it. We would have got it Planned Parenthood. So we, we desperately need a president to sign these things into office. And, and I understand the level of frustration. I, you know, you want to grab me by the throat and say, John, you know, get this stuff done. Uh, but uh, the reality is, we have been able to get a number of things like that done, getting it vetoed. Uh, Waters of the U.S., these others, we were able to use a congressional ability there, put those things on the president's desk. And again, it vetoed it. We simply don't have the two-thirds that you need, which is a, a very, very high threshold, uh, you know, as you go forward. One thing that we have done that, that I think that we, that we forget about is that these are things that, that were done in executive order. These are things that are done by the agencies. These are overreaches. They'll eventually get many of them overturned by the court if we're able to get a court that is going to interpret the Constitution as the founders intended it and as rule makers and written rules. Um, so the other thing, that's a good thing. The other thing is we really have not allowed a lot of this stuff uh, since they were in complete control, we haven't allowed it to, it to get into law. And that's a good thing in the sense that the president would desperately like to, to get so many of these things enacted in law. Once it is in law, you know, once it is Obamacare, once it's Dodd-Frank and things like that, a law is much, much harder to undo than an executive order or thing from the agency. All right, we've got five minutes left. I'm going to try to get two more questions in. The Senate has responsibility of confirming Supreme Court justices. Are the Republicans ready to fight if the liberals in the White House? Well, I think they are. I think that the you know I think you can be very proud of what they've done really under a lot of fire earlier in the year. And McConnell said, you know, we're going to do the precedent that we've had for the last 80 years. Last year of a presidency, we aren't going to approve a Supreme Court judge. And uh, the president, being smart in this regard, 
came forward with a judge that was well respected. Again, called a moderate. He's not a moderate. He would be a reliable fifth vote always for their side, always. They voted in block. And would, would be able to articulate, much like Scalia articulated the conservative cause so well, he would be able to articulate the liberal cause very well. So we've stood up. There was a lot of pressure on a lot of members, particularly members in tough states. You know, it's a little easier in Arkansas because, you know, Arkansans understand how important these things are, and they want judges that are going to interpret the law. But states like uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Hampshire, where they're in tough races, uh, those Senate candidates, those senators have stood firm, and as a result, we simply aren't going to confirm it. So I think, you know, Coach Bowles used to, to talk about when I was there, the past performance is indicative of future performance. And in that regard, I think you really can be very proud. And, and uh, I know I'm going to do everything that I can. This, you know, you can get rid of a president in four years if you don't like him. We're talking about appointments that probably are going to be there 20, 25 years. So that would profoundly change our country. Last question. What can we do as average citizens to help advance limited government policy? Well, I think, and I appreciate you so much because I know how active you are. You're busy. You've got you know lives that, that everybody's so busy these days. But you do it just like you've done. You band together. Uh, you you not only band together and you know talk about things. You actually do something. And there's no substitute for people like yourself talking to a neighbor, uh, talking to a friend or whatever, with conviction. You can't think that stuff, talking with conviction, you know, about uh, the reasons that we need to move in a particular direction. The, re the reason that we need to, uh, uh, you know, elect uh, candidates that we're talking about, people that are going to follow the, uh, uh, the things that, uh, that are so, so very important. Senator, we thank you for your time. We thank you for coming up here and talking well, about all this thank you, Dave, as always, for you know, your insight. Thanks for uh, Americans for Prosperity. Great, great group, again, that is working hard in regard to the last question. You know, you band with people like this. You try and broaden your, your coalitions as much as you can broaden. Uh, and, and as a result of, of, of uh, you know, you all pushing back, throughout the country. Standing up, uh, we would have had cap and trade a few years ago when the Democrats were in control completely if it weren't for you all. So uh, that's how you fight back. We've got to continue to do that. The presidential election is a huge, huge thing. You just have to look at that. And I'm not being you know, in the sense of pushing one way or the other. Since this isn't a, uh, you know, that kind of a, Deal. You're not going to get them in trouble, so. but you have to, you know, you have to look in terms of, you know, who's going to do the best job about the, the things we're talking about. And so, uh, you know, we need to get people out to vote, educate them, and then just go from there. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator John Bozeman.